Ese es el lamento de mi corazón No puedo encontrar razón y flow en este son Solo pregunto why Solo pregunto why, why, why. Él vino como una rata en la noche Alterando tierra, arrastrando sangre How would we have known that he would come from miles away? Solo pregunto Why, why, why Solo pregunto Why, why, why There's a lot of writers here today and I'm sure a lot of us ask ourselves Why write? And here's my few words. I don't know why write. Just write. Enough of the fear. Write to write the world. Write to stop wars. Write to change yourself. To fight that greatest war. The one against yourself, as Muhammad says. Write to educate your child. Write to entertain to pass on your stories to the next generation. Write so that others won't be forgotten, so that there will be a document. Write, write without stopping. You've been silent long enough. You've been far too mortal. It's time to write. It's time to denounce and cajole and love. It's time to forget the silence, forget forgetting. It's time to write. Write to resurrect the dead, To plead God's mercy. Write to bring back your lover. Write so that you can breathe. Write with the rhythm of your breath, with your eyes closed. It's time to slay the enemy with a few well-aimed stories. There is nothing in this world better than knowing that you've written the truth. Write, write. It's time to kill those midgets pretending to be giants. It's time to burst their bubble. Write to pray. Write to remind yourself that you're alive. That you've been resurrected. Write. Don't stop writing. Because if you stop, you'll die. Don't even stop to reread. Or you'll turn to stone. And the salt of your bones will be remembered as bitter. Write, damn it. Just write. Este es el lamento de mi corazón No puedo encontrar razón ni flow en este sol From miles away It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with everyone. I'm starting to recognize a lot of familiar faces, uh, people that shared space with me online and during the whole world shutting down. So that was very special, thank you. Today we're gonna start with uh, two pieces by Ms. Donna Snyder. Um, I'd like to introduce an older piece and then a piece from her book. Okay, here we go. 
The old man is small, but the mic makes his voice bold. He hits all the right notes and holds them just long enough. The sweet high ones, the resonant low, the music comes from a laptop. The speaker, about three feet high, sits on a stool. The accompaniment, not too loud to chat if one has a dinner partner. The mariscos are as fresh as you can find in the middle of the Chihuahua Desert. The limonada sweet but tart enough to demonstrate the reality of limes. La musica tan romantica. El musico modest but with a knowing smile. He croons Juan Gabriel, Trio, Los Pancho, Smokey Robinson, and the Miracles. The old ones, corny ones, that bring tears and memories of someone man enough to love me and proclaim it to all. 87 God years he promised. 87 years he would love me and said that he loved me from the time he was in his mother's womb, that he could sense my existence like a deity in a temple making its presence known. Que lastima he left me here. In a world where no one gets my sense of humor, I rail at him up there in el cielo, shaking my fist at clouds color de rosa mexicana as he taught me to call the color pink, también the color inside the pearly lip of a concha. Outside the cafe, the horizon turns gray. At home, my dog waits in my bed. When I return, she'll whimper and whine. Happy to see me, but wishing I was a cute boy who doesn't live here anymore. The one who doesn't love me and holds her heart no more closely than a used tissue. As the mood turns from grief to bitterness, it's time to go home, join my boxer in the bed, size for a queen. But no queens live in that house, and all the kings are dead or gone. By Ms. Donna Snyder, thank you. Okay, now one from her amazing book with very powerful art being sold here tonight. I see a lot of copies going around. They're located at this table somewhere. Here we go. Language zings through air like neon tracers. Coffee drinkers quit stirring their cups. Girls grab pens to scribble on scraps. She makes illicit lovers break gaze. Words whistle and dance and poetry happens. Boys turn shy and think of women. She who speaks truth to power, an aspect of the triple goddess. She who embodies change, workforce for justice, maker of kings, caster of spells, inciter of riots. She who wields the power of words. Ms. Donna Snyder, thank you so much for everything you've done for us. We love you so much. Let's go ahead and get loud, because that's how we show love. Let's welcome to the mic, Donna Snyder. Thanks, Richie. Thanks a lot, Richie. Richie Marufo, El Spoken Word of El Paso, Texas. Mr. Spoken Word of El Paso, Texas. You know, I hope the band shows back up, but I remember bands when they disappear halfway through the show, <laughs> and when they, they may or may not come back, and may or may not remember the notes when they get here. There he is, hey David. <laughs> um, so, my glasses are steaming up. This is my book, as meaningful as any other. <laughs> Published by Gutter Snob Books. Wave your hand. I really hope that you'll go and buy a book from her because she drove all the way down from Colorado just to support me here. And since she nudged me to send her a manuscript and 
I got sick for a long time. I'm like, hey, are you still looking at manuscripts? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> and so then finally I wrote her again, are you still looking for manuscripts? I'm finally thinking in poetry again. And she goes, yeah, 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 yeah. So I sent it to her on a Friday evening. And in the meantime, my friend, Mr. Tesosomak of Southern Cal, a gifted poet and philosopher and also a visual artist, he, he read some of my poems and he created the art that's on the cover and inside the book in response to my poems which I'm very adamant to make sure everyone knows because a book review said that I wrote my poems in response to his art, which isn't the truth. Anyway, <laughs> he's a very generous man and gave me his art and the response that he had to my poetry, which is kind of a wonderful gift. And um, let's see, there were other things I wanted to say about Michelle too. She's uh, an amazing woman and has a whole lot of people that she's publishing in her first year with Gutter Snob Press that she's founded. And so I hope each of you will find time to, you know, if you don't want my book, I don't, that's fine. But slip her a five for some gas money, what do you say? You know, buy her a beer if you can. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> she treated me like a queen, man. I sent out my manuscript at about I think 10 o'clock on a Friday night and by 11 o'clock the next morning I had an acceptance <laughs> so that was novel for me and um, a very great pleasure so this book is a little different for me it, it has like five parts and the first part is mythology some of which is true and some of which I just made up. And <laughs> it took me this long to realize that poetry is not history. <laughs> you know, and poetry is not fact necessarily. And so um, I'm gonna start with a piece I, that begins the book actually, the first section of the book. And you know, my people, my people came from the Appalachian, my, my father came from the Appalachian mountain parts of Pennsylvania, the coal company and coal country, and my mother's people, they came from the Ozarks, Missouri and Arkansas Ozarks. So this piece isn't really about my people, but in the little place I lived in, in Twitty, Texas, um, that they brought me home to from the Shamrock Public hospital, there was a dugout that was the entryway to the storm cellar that we spent a lot of time in because mother was deathly afraid of storms. And But that dugout was a piece of history because before the farmers bled the Ogallala aquifer <laughs> to nothing, um, there were no trees. It was not a green place, the Texas Panhandle. And so they lived in the ground in dugouts. And um, this is about that. And it's called Split Blood Severed Root. Back before her blood got split, back when the ancient ones dug holes in the baked dirt, slept in dugouts like roots severed and saved for coming winter, a smoky darkness everywhere. The harsh breeze chafes her cheeks as the mother prepares morning gruel. But she is the severed root, wanting to be fed to hunger, to solace emptiness. A severed root in the cellar waiting to be consumed. Not the goodness of the hearth, nor mother, nor grandmother. She's the bad daughter up and gone before time to cook and serve. Absconded away in a place long deserted by the old ones. There are black stones in a circle. Sometimes it is cold in the darkness and she creeps back to the hole in the earth where the others sleep and dream of open sky. 
She can smell them before she sees them. Her nose twitches at something to savor, at the redolence of humans in the den of their pack. The mother smells of fire, of tears in the morning. The father's hands are rough like stones, yet so gentle on the hair. And the sisters sleep obediently in the night, work obediently even before the dawn. But she is not those people who struggle, who live like vegetables put away for the coming dark times. Nah, she's the crazy one who runs away when it is time to make the morning meal. She sings songs to herself, sings to the animals who gather around her, stay close to her knees, hoping for a caress or a sniff of her skirt. Nah, not the mother, not the grandmother not the obedient sisters. She is split blood, the severed root. The woman who runs away to the desert lives in a stone circle with her animals and her words. You come to her, she'll tell you a story. Recently, I was in the hospital in a nursing home for 32 days, and my mother died while I was in there. And um, it's probably a pretty good thing that she died before this book came out. Uh, she, 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 but um, anyway, bless her soul. On. This one is dedicated to Max Higgs. Saturated with secrets. Never much good with secrets. I hang my dirty linen out to dry. Confession's damp map of Spain in sun-drenched mountain air. I sweep grated red yam, make piles of ruby peel that smell vaguely vegetal until withered, pallid, and dry as unwanted flesh. Beneath the rug, I stash night's ash, but you roll it into a riddle's cruelty, redolent of conch, a shiny madness meted out in rhythm and early rhyme. Moist whispers, soft against naked skin. Sustenance found alone in shadows soaked with ululations. Secrets known only to you, me, and every nose and ear near enough to sense the senselessness of skin, of sky, of the never-ending sigh. things this book does is it, it indicates within it how strangely enough for a little girl from Twitty, Texas, um, I became imprinted and influenced by visual art at the very earliest of ages in that interest in visual art followed me through my life. Um, and the artist that influenced me intellectually um, also influenced me politically. And um, there's a poem in it, I'm not reading it because it's kind of long and complicated, but there's a poem in it, the book, that talks about those, those poets who influenced me and how they did Guglielmi and his slums and Hopper and his lonely urban redheads and and others, you know. Um, so this particular poem is another what's called a frastic writing, 
and it's from a, and I really don't know anything about this artist, but this painting is from, this poem is from a painting by Pavel de Nikolaev. And to me, well, I never know what my poems are about when I'm writing them. Um, you know, they just kind of like come out in a few for the most part. I'm not one of those intellectuals who plan them and write them to a plan and not like that at all. But lots of times after the fact, somebody else will tell me, hey, well, you know, this is about so-and-so. Like, mm, that sounds reasonable. <laughs> And this poem um, kind of seems to give some um, insight into why I spent most of my life working uh, on behalf of people who needed my work as opposed to people who could pay for my work. And that was kind of uh, controversial where I'm from, you know, small town, and they're like, Donna Joe, how come you got all this education? You're out there wasting it on the Indians. I'm like, you know, because we were, we were poor folks, and I was kind of expecting, if I was going to be a lawyer, I might as well make some money and help people out, right? And then when I worked at Centro Lega Campesino, my father, a very kind and generous man, but all of his best friends were ranchers and farmers, and he gets on the phone, he's like, well, Donna Joe, what? Do, do I understand this right? You sue farmers? <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, Daddy, sometimes they don't treat their workers right. Well, anyhow, I think this kind of gives some insight into why I did that kind of work for all my, pretty much all my legal life. Monstrous angel. Brown-eyed angel, smudged wings, lavender gray, draped from sloped shoulders. Coarse spun tunic trimmed with lyres, a field of lilac. A determined mouth, pursed, red with readiness. Domed eyes the size of elbows. Gabled brow, twice as large as her round head of flat earth, trees, and houses for a crown. Upstretched arms hold the earth steady. Legs splayed, bare feet point toward the ground below her. A city at her knees, each window illuminated in gold. Both unearthly and of this earth, she has a secret. She carries the world on her head. She is the X that marks the spot. Thank you very much for paying so much attention. if that was your intent was to take three more months off my lifespan. <laughs> well done. Um, this book is called um, As Meaningful as Any Other. And it's a line from this poem. Well, it's a piece, prose thing, called Blank Check. And it starts out with a quote. Like, every once in a while I try to pretend like I'm intellectual or something, I guess. But anyway, it starts out with a quote. It is a random universe to which we bring meaning. And it's out of Eschatological Laundry List by Sheldon Kopp. I think I wrote it in a Tumble Words workshop by Monica, led by Monica Gomez, but I may be mistaken. Mary Mooney? Okay. Mary Mooney in the striped shirt back there. We live in a random universe to which we supply meaning. So just do it. Interpret the signs that surround you. Use the titles of records in the antique jukebox as a meaningful tool of augury. 
Throw in the name of the cafe in which you find yourself a pocket full of quarters and time. Always start with Patsy Klein. And if your jukebox has no Patsy in it, in and of itself, that deficiency is a sign with which you must reckon. Ignore the flatulence of the woman weeping at the next table. Tears flooding her lonely face. Do not, however, ignore the tears or that lonely face. Ask the waitress for some blank guest checks off the pad she uses to take orders. Let the size of those blank checks dictate the length of your notes from the symbology the universe has assigned you for your interpretive pleasure. Don't forget that the name of what you're writing on is a blank check. For this fact also has meaning, as meaningful as any other. The sound of the music, the words contained in the song titles, the rhythm of the cafe door as it swings open and shut, the periodicity of the crying woman's flatus, the size and number of guest checks the waitress has shared with you. These are your only parameters. Let your thoughts fall like rain. Read the glyphs that appear upon the paper before you, and oracle writing itself. You supply the meaning. Okay, let's hear it for the band. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
And this one's called She Walks in Circles. Nah, I can't read because of those cold ones. She walks in circles on the stone. Not sure if alone or if I'm with her. Not sure if the shapes and shadows are birds or trees. The roar of the train, a monster growing inside her head. A monster grows inside her head. She was la chingona de la casa también, man. Even the day before she died, she was blind and half crippled, and my pit bull came in and headed for her pan of food, and boom, she was off the sofa and running over there to him. She could take down that pit bull. <laughs> well, this is a poem called Phoebe, and... Um, I wrote it for my friend Phoebe in Virginia, who's just the, one of the most talented poets I know. And when I did, um, I thought, Phoebe, Phoebe, that must be some kind of like Southern bastard, bastardization of Phoebe. And so I Googled Phoebe, and sure enough, Phoebe was a titan, and she was the source of the sun and all before Apollo and... Artemis took over the took all the credit. She also was associated with the Delphi, the Oracle at Del Delphi, and um, associated with the crossroads between death and life. And so this is a poem called Phoebe, and I wrote it for my friend Phoebe Venable. Titan of prophecy and moonlight. Daughter of earth and sky, mother of the stars and that which is hidden. Through her came the sun and the moon, the bright and shining ones. You can find her at the crossroad between death and life. She takes horror and makes it beauty. Oracles run in her blood. Deer offer themselves at her door, follow her into the wooded mountains. Wolves stand guard from afar. She takes sorrow and makes it glow. She has the bones of a generous woman. She scries the ultimate outcome from blue water. Dogs gather around her feet. She paints time's death with song. I thought that would be more cheerful <laughs> than it turned out, but that sometimes does. When I was uh, looking at this manuscript, I was to get, when, when I was trying to come up with sets for readings and stuff, I wrote Robin Schofield. <laughs> I'm like, Robin, I don't have anything to read it. Readings, everything in this book is sad. <laughs> and Robin says, well, Donna, that's your oeuvre, you know? <laughs> that's what you do. Oh, well. This one was published uh, in Oxygen, Parables of the Pandemic, River Paw Press in 2022, out of LA, an anthology, and it was about the pandemic. But really and truly, it's about this nurse I saw in the, this doctor I saw in the emergency room who, heesh, man, worked so hard to save my life and get me services and all. And she was an amazing, amazing doctor. It's called Sanctified. She can make the heat death of the universe a thing of beauty. And an exploding star an object of desire. But gravity and untimely death eludes her magic. 
Killers proceed like a curse written in an ancient alphabet. Death, indifferent to color or class, turns crowns of glory into meat hooks, pierces our flesh, steals our breath, pulls us into that final black hole. Our bodies sanctified. The mix of every color together disappear into the ultimate dark. I always forget to say in the introduction that that curse written in an ancient alphabet is supposed to refer to, to uh, you know, the pandemic, how it was all in different Greek letters and all. But I forget to say that, and so people kind of miss that. All righty. Now, this is my last poem I'm going to read. And it's not even in my book. It was published recent, recently, well, first in a bilingual Hindi and English journal out of Pittsburgh in June. And then recently it was published in this um, Indian weekly art supplement, I think, from the Indian News or something like that. A friend just took it and gave it to him. So get ready to get fucking fired up. This is called <laughs> Untimely Death Declared, One Day Left. One day left. Time to prioritize. Assume the stars say do whatever you want with what little time you have left. Spend the rent on charming ballet slippers. Dance at the ball until way past midnight. Laugh until you wet yourself. No matter. Turn all your oh no's into oh yes. Say hello to a spring which won't ever become a fall. Make some room for pudding. The real kind made of whole milk and eggs. You will definitely need your dogs with you. They've never heard of hour or year. They will give miniature barks in their sleep and deep sighs when you give them kisses. And I do give my dogs kisses. Begin now the journey until your dying day. Write your own prescription for poetry. Read out loud every poet you've ever loved. Eat a feast prepared with you in mind. Remember the power of word medicine. Confound folks with your command of facts. Suddenly, you remember everything you ever knew. Nothing forgotten now. Dementia, just another state you're passing through on your trip across the great plains and spaces. Tell your stories to an appreciative audience. How you danced to drums in Sitka. Disappeared into the ocean mists and midnight light. Enjoy mesmerizing accounts of adventure tales. Marvel at a flock of eagles in a single tree. Find a boy who knows the meaning of life. Feel the energy of warriors fallen to a massacre. Tell the folks you won't be home for Christmas. Fly to Edinburgh and then drive to Skye. Take the high road. Let the others take the low road. Sink deep into a leather sofa. Don't expect anyone to understand. No one will love you with a love sublime. When the last grain falls through the hourglass figure you never had, join an angel chant in three-part harmony. 
We understand. We understand. There was one day left, and you sucked the morrow of those final 24. Thank you for coming. Woo!